on Tuesday we talked about the um, the mutations and how they arise. Now it's time to discuss how cell can repair them. First of all, we've already figured out that DNA polymerase is the pretty um, error-proof enzyme. It corrects itself and makes mistakes um, very infrequently. Uh, now, if there is an incorrect base inserted, then you have a disturbance um, in in the helix, I wanted to say in the force, and the fragment without pairing is removed and the correct bases or base are or is inserted and the um, shape of the helix is maintained normal. So DNA polymerase kind of, is that the right one? If it's not, I'll throw it away and put the right one. Is that the right one? No. I'll put the next one. Oh, that's the right one. Let's move on. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, another way is another problem with, with uh, mutations. The, the example of mutation that we're going to talk about is the thymine dimer. You can see it right here. So those thymine dimers. Uh, they're formed as the result of exposure of DNA to UV light. And that is one of the reasons why UV light can be used as the um, sterilist, well, not disinfection technique. Okay. So when thymine dimers are formed, since these residues have a covalent bond established between them, they cannot form proper hydrogen bonds with the complementary adenine residues on the entire parallel strand of the DNA. Since there are no hydrogen bonds, helix is distorted. In this case, the group of enzymes, the repair enzymes, which include nuclease, helicase, and DNA polymerase 1, and DNA ligase, start to fix the problem. Nuclease removes the fragment. It cuts the damaged fragments on the sides. Helicase then takes the fragment away, kind of holds it out. And then DNA polymerase 1 fills the gap and DNA ligase stitches the newly synthesized fragment to the ends of the repaired strand. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Then it's going to be uracil. So, um, how does it? Go ahead. Yes, it's not good. Good notice. Yes. So, how does it work in that case? For for example, for single strand RNA viruses. Exactly. Okay. In this case, if thi well, not thymine, but say uracil dimers or cytosine dimers are formed when viral RNA gets replicated, the replication either stalls or makes mistakes. Does that make sense? Because viruses are different. They can take one RNA molecule okay, and copy it into two RNA molecules on the very basic level. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, the copy is going to be bad, virus becomes not viable, okay? And since genome is used to express the genes, if there are multiple mistakes, then proteins of the virus will become faulty. Does that make sense? Yeah, but, um, and virus will not be functional anymore. Go ahead. No, no, 
when it gets yes well dimers gets into the cell when there is a potential infection virus will not be able to reproduce in the cell normally okay. you damage the virus like imagine that you have a seed of plant and you do something bad to it I don't know what and then you put it in the, in the ground it simply will not grow because it's somehow damaged so it's not Within the, Within the strand. Yes. Yes. Got it. Yes. Within the strand. UV light actually has other effects. It may produce in the virus specifically was shown that it may modify the proteins that form the virus and the RNA or DNA effectively stitching them together. So viral, say, RNA gets uh, covalently bound to the proteins of the virus and it cannot work because we didn't talk about the viral structure yet and I don't want to go into that just now okay but essentially it's the formation of covalent bonds that are not supposed to be there okay um, now that process the repair by the excision happens in the dark. The photoreactivation happens when the light is present and that's more frequent for UV light because when when are you getting exposed to UV light? When you're outside, when you are under the sun, so it's it's light. So what happens? <clears throat> when UV light causes the formation <clears throat> of thymine dimers, the enzyme called photolyase, it's illustrated here as the partly transparent uh, green oval, okay? Photolyase recognizes the dimers, binds to that DNA fragment, and breaks down the covalent bond between two adjacent thymines. When this bond is broken, then thymines can establish the hydrogen bonds with adenines in the opposite strand normally now. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Correct. Um, if you think about, you know, like think about repairs that you can do at home. Sometimes you have something, <clears throat> I can't think of anything, but there's something broken, you take a glue and you fix it. Sometimes there's something broken, uh, the part of uh, furniture, and you say, oh, screw that. You throw away the entire furniture item and buy the new one. So this is sort of a low-cost repair, okay, when you just quickly fix things. This is throwing out a furniture item and buying a new one. Yes. In the light. Correct. So one in the left, there is no photo activation, doesn't require light to get activated. The one in the right, photolyase, requires exposure to the visible light to get activated. Good? No, it doesn't really matter. It's all the same. Yeah, it's all the same. We don't get exposed to UV light here, so we don't produce time and dimers because this these lamps do not produce radiation in the UV uh, range, but the sun does. Now, how do we identify mutagens? For this, we will have to uh, recall, okay, couple of things. First, the, the whole idea of mutation. So when mutation, remember mutation is the change, uh, in this case in the DNA, because we're going to discuss the example of bacteria, okay? Change in the DNA that, and that change, that alteration in the DNA, causes a certain phenotype. So it affects 
a particular gene, okay, and causes changes the phenotype of bacteria. Okay, does that make sense? Second, we will need to recall what is oxytroph. So oxytrophs, I mentioned them before. Oxytroph, oxytrophic microbes are the ones that require a specific nutrient in the growth medium. Does that make sense? Not? They are fastidious, yes. Uh, well, for, let's say in Assyria, uh, gonorrhea is fastidious microbe. You have to grow it on a complex medium that is additionally enriched with iron. Okay? Um, it will not grow on just a complex medium. Oxotrophic microbes, we definitely know that they cannot produce a certain chemical that wild-type microbes can. Let me give you an example. Say, we work with the Salmonella tifimurum here, okay? Generally, Salmonella can produce all amino acids. But there are mutants that cannot produce one or two. So, you can grow Salmonella, wild-type Salmonella, on the minimum medium, the defined medium that has amino acids or like even very limited number of amino acids uh, and salts and stuff. But if you get oxotrophic mutant that, for instance, requires histidine for sure, then you got to grow oxotrophic mutant on the media that has histidine. Fastidious microbes, we often do not know which growth factor, which nutrient they actually need. Does that make sense? We just know that they don't grow on this, on TSA, but if we enrich it with sheep's blood, I don't know, um, magnesium telluride or something else, they will grow. How it works, what exactly does it do, is not really clear, but we're not that much interested. Okay? Now, Salmonella. We use Salmonella here as an example. Usually, the, this test for muted, mutagenesis is, is done on Salmonella. Now, as you can imagine, we have millions and millions of bacterial cells in the culture. And those millions of bacterial cells are very different. Among those, there are different types of mutants. So in this case, in the first step of the, in the preparation for the test, we are interested in oxotrophic mutants that absolutely require the amino acid histidine. Does that make sense? It can be histidine, it can be tryptophan, any amino acid that, that we can think of, honestly. Okay, does that make sense so far? Okay. So what we do, we do replica plating. So we have a set of colonies, many, many colonies of Salmonella that grow on the medium that has histidine in it. And we do a little, um, I don't know how to say, the, the pad, the velvet pad. So we collect pretty much all the colonies and we press this pad against the medium that contains histidine and the medium that doesn't. Does that make sense so far? These are all different colonies and on the medium that does not contain histidine, oxotrophic mutants will not grow. Does it make sense? Oxotrophic mutants. Microbes that require histidine in the medium will not be able to grow in the medium which does not have histidine. Does that make sense? 
Okay, like people who absolutely must, I don't know, eat something, eat eggs, will not go. People who love steak will not go to vegetarian restaurants because vegetarian restaurant does not have steaks. Okay? So we can compare, <clears throat> sorry, the colonies that we observe on the histidine rich and histidine lacking medium and we can identify this colony because it's absent here as the colony of oxotrophic mutants. Does that make sense? We pretty much subtract the colonies. Does that make sense? Colonies that can grow everywhere. Okay, now we have our oxytrophic mutants. Microbe that cannot produce amino acid histidine, which is abnormal. Now, why all this, why all this bother? Because then we can test. The mutagen will randomly cause various mutations in a given microbe. And one of those mutations, if we expose our oxotrophic mutants to the mutagen, one of those mutations may revert the mutant to the wild type. Does it make sense? Okay, no? It doesn't? Okay, yes. Wild type or what? Histidine? Yeah, histidine. So is that a specific amino acid? Yes, yes. Okay. That's one out of 21 amino acids. Okay, so for oxytrophic, it's that's one, that one. Histidine? Histidine is missing. So it's not missing in the protein sequence. It cannot make it biochemically so it has to get it from the outside okay so this is just to identify if microbe is needs histidine to continue propagating this first part this first part yes in the first part in the preparation for the test we need to find the oxytrophic mutants which we're going to use later to test for the mutagenesis. I will let me walk you through this and then I will give you a dynamic picture as Courtney. They are not more like, they are wild type, okay? The colonies that can grow on the histidine lacking medium are the wild type colonies because they don't need it they, they still can make it but the colonies that cannot grow are the ones that we're looking for they lack they 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 don't make histidine and by comparing the medium without and with histidine we can figure out which colonies um are the same i forgot this english word Match okay. Which colonies are actually the uh, oxotrophic? Okay, so we've got our Salmonella. Olivia, I remember your gesture, so we'll get through this. We've got our oxotrophic mutants. Okay, and then we do the control. Okay, we plate oxotrophic mutant on the histidine lacking medium as a control or we expose our oxotrophic mutant to the mutagen and play after the exposure to the mutagen played it also on histidine lacking medium now some of the microbes will naturally revert to the wild type just because mutations always occur does that make sense so we may have a couple of mutants, a couple of wild type cells in the control. If mutagen works, if mutagen actually causes the reversion from histidine deficient to the wild type, from oxytrophic to the wild type, 
we will see way more wild type colonies in the experimental plate. Uh, with the yesterday class, what really helped is the dynamic picture. And that's what I'm going to do. Remember, it's all getting recorded. We got one student in Monday class who asked me, can I make a picture? And when I mentioned about YouTube, turns out she didn't know. OK, so we start with Salmonella. Oh, come on, dude. Salmonella tifimurum, OK, which is histidine negative. Now, in order to make sure that we are on the same page, when I write histidine negative, what does that mean? What does that mean? Huh? Doesn't produce histidine. Well, we call it oxotrophic. Where does it get histidine? From the media. If we pl plate this salmonella onto the histidine lacking medium, is it going to grow? No. Everybody got this. All right? We good? Plate. No histidine. We plate salmonella on this agar without histidine, without any treatment, just oxotrophic. Is it possible that some of the oxotrophic microbes will revert to the original wild type phenotype? Yes. Is it going to be frequent? Probably not. These colonies, what's going to be their phenotype in terms of the histidine? Can they make histidine or can they not? They can. So we can say, is that right? Is that clear? That's the control. Okay? Another plate, again, no histidine, but before plating, we expose salmonella to the mutagen. You have to appreciate when we expose, yes. Mutagen is the chemical, I don't know, toothpaste, component of the toothpaste, component of the hand cream, component of the windshield washer fluid. We don't know whether it causes mutations or not. It's some chemical that we are testing. Uh, a light bulb, does it produce the radiation or not? Does that make sense? Okay, it's just some sort of exposure. So we expose salmonella to the mutagen. Potential, yes. So we're, we're trying to figure out whether a chemical or something else is a mutagen or not. Yes, so that's why I put potential, okay? okay? We don't know yet. Now, if it causes mutations, does it increase chances for reversion? Statistically, yes. So if we have not two, but I don't know, a lot of colonies that can grow on the medium that locks histidine, what's going to be the phenotype of those colonies? Histidine plus. That's good. Does that make sense? That's it. Now, what if there are no just like same number of colonies that are in the control? Is the chemical a mutagen? No. Does that make sense? Better? There is one component that we haven't discussed. Liver extract. Why? Why we add liver extract? No. We add it not to the medium. We add it to during the exposure. 
What is the function of liver? Modify chemicals. Hmm? Modify chemicals. So maybe mutagen by itself is not mutagenic, but when it passes through the liver, it becomes mutagenic. Does that make sense? It's kind of an additional kick. Okay. Now you have to understand, it doesn't mean that if we get positive result in the AIMS test, we immediately ban this chemical from everywhere. We now are aware of the potential mutagenicity and can study this chemical in mice, rats, dogs, whatever. Okay, we can see if it actually causes the mutagenesis and any health effects in the large animals. Does that make sense? That's how we test for for mutants. Is that clear? Can we move on? We're going to talk about sex, bacterial sex. So it's not that exciting. Um, as you remember, sexual reproduction that we can find in eukaryotes, especially in the higher eukaryotes, gives them the advantage of genetic diversity. Genes from mother and father uh, are both present in the child and maintain that genetic diversity in the population, preventing population from becoming extinct due to the bless you, potentially lethal recessive genes that would become uh, expressed during the, the inbred crossings. Okay. Um, so prokaryotes, on the other hand, when they when the cell divides, daughter cells have the same DNA as the parent cell, with maybe couple of mutations. Does that make sense? So division, cell division per se, the reproduction in the way that, that bacteria or archaea perform it, that reproduction cannot maintain the genetic diversity. Turns out that they maintain, the prokaryotes maintain genetic diversity or achieve genetic diversity through what we call horizontal gene transfer. Technically speaking, sexual reproduction in mammals, fish, amphibia, reptiles, it is also horizontal gene transfer to an extent, okay? Genes from both parents get mixed up. Well, then they pass down to the, uh, to the progeny. So it's both horizontal and then vertical, but in bacteria it is truly a horizontal gene transfer. There are three major ways of gene exchange, genetic information exchange in prokaryotes. One is transformation, when naked free DNA is taken into the bacterial cell. I'm going to use bacteria for simplicity if you don't mind. So I don't have to mention archaea all the time, okay? But archaea employ the same strategies, okay? Transduction, which involves viruses of the um, prokaryotes, so-called bacteriophages. And conjugation, when microbes exchange genetic information using external appendages that we know as pili. We're going to talk about each of these processes separately. The transformation was discovered by Friedrich Griffith. As usual, I have no idea when. The 20th century, maybe 40th, something like that. He was studying two strains of Streptococcus pneumonia. One strand was non-pathogenic and was called a rough strand. Okay. It didn't have capsule. Another strand was pathogenic, smooth. And its virulence factor was the presence of capsule. So if you injected mice, inoculated mice, with a non-virulent strand, mice survived because it's non-virulent. Uh, well, 
something that is not present on the picture, but let me tell you, if you inoculated mice with a virulent strain, <coughs> sorry, they died. Does that make sense? Pathogenic smooth strand killed the mice, non-pathogenic did not. Pretty straightforward. Now what Griffith did next is he inactivated the pathogenic strand, boiled it pretty much. And when he inoculated, inactivated microbe, microbe that could not replicate, okay, into the mice, despite its being pathogenic when it's live, killed strain, killed smooth strep pneumonia, did not kill mice at all. Which kind of makes sense, right? You boil it, you kill it, it doesn't replicate, so replication is definitely required. Then he did a wonderful experiment. He mixed dead pathogenic bacteria and live non-pathogenic. Well, guess what? Mice died. So it looked like there was something in the pathogenic bacteria that despite they were dead, that some that this this factor something transformed the non-pathogenic one into a killer and Griffith was able to isolate strep pneumonia from mice that succumbed to to this infection and inoculate that freshly isolated strep into the mice and it killed them also. Essentially, he was following the Cox postulates. Make sense? So, what happens if you mix <clears throat> live non-virulent and dead virulent strains together, they produce a live virulent strand. Of course, the question was how, for a long time, Griffith, Griffith initially the, suggested that it was proteins that are transferred from pathogenic strand, although being killed, to the non-pathogenic strand and make it, make it killer, right? Well, later it was shown that it was not proteins, it was DNA. When pathogenic strep pneumonia gets boiled or destroyed by any other means, its DNA gets released. Non-pathogenic strep pneumonia can uptake that DNA and either incorporate it in its own chromosome, as you can see here, or keep it in the form of plasmid as extra chromosomal DNA. Okay? Now, we briefly mentioned plasmids as the extra chromosomal DNA that carries virulence factors. Right? Now, there are, um, I think, Clostridium botulinum sometimes carries its toxin in the plasmid. So you can, technically speaking, remove plasmid from the cell and the cell becomes absolutely non-pathogenic. It is still functional because it's extra chromosomal fragment, right? Extra chromosomal DNA. Does that make sense? So essentially, if we go back, what happens is when there is free DNA in the environment, <clears throat> whether it's plasmid or chromosomal DNA. It can be taken into the cell, usually by some kind of a shock, stress, okay? And it can get incorporated into the chromosome, which happens infrequently. 
or more frequently it will stay as a plasmid in a cytoplasm of the bacterial cell. Does that make sense? The important thing is genes that are on this plasmid can be expressed by this bacterial cell. And that opens a gigantic field of possibilities for the biotechnology. Imagine that you want to produce a protein. Let's say, um, I cannot think of anything else. Uh, glucagon, growth hormone, human growth hormone. It's a protein which can be used for treatment of, say, pituitary dwarfism. Okay? Synthesizing it using classical organic chemistry will make growth hormone the most, the costliest compound on earth. It will be, it will cost more than its weight in, in gold and it's going to be extremely expensive. Instead, we can take the gene that encodes for growth hormone and stick it into the plasmid. This is your target gene. We pretend it's going to be growth hormone. You follow me? Then you take this plasmid, mix it with some kind of a bacteria that is easy to grow, let's say E. coli, okay, and shock them. Shock usually includes exposure of bacteria to about 42 degrees Celsius, and then you put them in ice. The change in the temperatures forces bacteria to take plasmid in, right? Make sense so far? I'm not going to ask this method. I just want to give you an idea how we, we can use that. Okay? And then, when you take that bacteria and put them on the plate or in any other media, they will start to express the gene that's on the plasmid. And they will start to produce the growth hormone in amounts that are astounding. We talk about grams. That's a lot. Okay? And you can grow and grow and grow them, and it's, it's fairly cheap. Okay? That makes sense? Now, the next question. You have a million of E. coli cells. Will every cell take the plasmid in? Probably not. It's going to be a statistical process with some efficiency. So how do we know which cells actually acquired plasmid and which cells didn't? For this, we need to insert certain marker, right? We need to insert another trait that would allow us to separate the cells. Uh, technically, we can insert some glow stuff. But picking cells that are glowing Picking colonies that are glowing can be a little bit uh, painful and time consuming. Much easier is to insert the gene that confers resistance to antibiotic. So now, bacteria that took the plasmid in are resistant to antibiotic. Bacteria that did not take it are not resistant. Does that make sense? When you plate them on the medium that has antibiotic, only the ones with the plasmid will survive. Now, it may sound... It, it's really <clears throat> kind of hard to imagine the... How to say in them In the words, in the form of words. So, I mean, you can, you can say, okay, you have bacterial cell, you have plasmid, okay, you shock them, and now you have a cell with a plasmid inside, okay? And they will survive on antibiotic-containing medium. Does that make sense? So because of this, because of the antibiotic resistance gene. Trust me, this is the best 
experiment that you can do in the lab. Because you come in, you know, prepare everything, do the shock. The only thing with the shock, you have to be very, very precise with the time. It's like 45 seconds. So put it in the bath, stick it in the ice. It sits in the ice for an hour. Everything gets taken in. <clears throat> you put it in the incubator overnight. And you go home. Come in next morning, take it out, plate it, go home. Come next morning, have colonies, pick the colony, put it in a, a liquid medium, go home. Well, not necessarily go home, but you have some other business. By the end of the week, you have a good amount of microbes that have the plasmid that produce whatever you want. It is actually a normal way. Insulin is produced this way. A lot of recombinant hormones are produced this way. So it's a, it's a very widely used uh, biotechnology technique. Does that make sense? Transduction. Um, that involves phages, and since I am tethered, I can, of course, untether, but I'm kind of lazy. And I would appreciate if somebody could bring over those models of phages to me so I can show them to you. Can you help me? The ones behind you, those fancy ones, yeah. Yeah, yeah, all of them. I will show you the stages. Okay, it's going to be, I'll peek into the, into the virus world. Thank you very much, Holly. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I very much appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'm going to use this models and I'm going to picture and stuff. So follow. First, uh, bullet point describes everything. So I, we can pretty much finish at this point. Bacteriophages can carry DNA between bacterial cells. Shall we move on? Not really, no. So what is bacteriophage? This is your bacterial cell, and here's the bacteriophage, okay? Can everybody see it? Okay, you see that? That's bacteriophage, that alien spaceship, right? That's the virus. It's not cellular structure, okay? It's um, only DNA and sometimes RNA and proteins. So it sits on the surface of the bacterial cell. and injects its DNA into it. Can you see that um, brownish stick? It goes, that's, that's DNA. Only DNA gets in the cell, okay? Don't worry about <clears throat> bacteriophage life cycle. I don't, bless you, I don't care that much about life cycle yet, okay? When DNA, DNA eventually is in the cell. I don't know if you can see the, the brownish. You see that right here? That's the DNA inside of the bacterial cell, okay? And the DNA gets reproduced. Well, guess what? It's bacteria that reproduces phage DNA. So phage pretty much hijacks the bacterial cell. It forces it to do whatever it wants it to do. So DNA gets replicated, right? And then genes, that DNA, get expressed. And those genes obviously encode for the proteins. And those proteins are the phage proteins. Okay? Phage proteins have, and virus proteins, have stunning, amazing capacity. They can self-assemble into the particles. Imagine that you buy a Lego and it assembles itself. It's pretty awesome. Okay, so they start to self-assemble, forming the virus particles. Those virus particles accumulate in the DNA molecule. They, of course, they incorporate the DNA molecules that 
are present there too. So you see a bunch of DNA molecules here. They get incorporated into the phage particles. So what you end up with is a bunch of the phage particles inside of bacterial cell. Bunch, we talk hundreds, if not thousands. And eventually when they leave the cell, cell gets ruined. It lyses. Does that make sense? This cycle that I just described to you is called a lytic cycle. Does that make sense? Good. Now, without switching, I want to tell you something. When cell gets ruined, what do you think happens to the chromosome of bacterial cell. It gets ruined too, pieces and stuff, okay? But it's not like one time explosion. It's not that bacterial cell just, you know, blows up. It's a continuous process. So cell slowly, fairly, well, not slow, but it kind of decays, okay? Disassembles. And DNA gets chopped off and chopped in pieces and so on and so forth. So when those virus particles assembled, some of them, just by mistake, accidentally, will pick up bacterial DNA. Does that make sense? So now you have a phage. So this is your proper phage with the phage DNA. But you're also going to have phage particles with the bacterial DNA. Does that make sense? Now, if these guys will infect the bacterial cell, they will insert the bacterial DNA inside. Does that make sense? So they will carry fragments of bacterial DNA to another bacterial cell. Does it make sense? This is called generalized transduction. The process that I just explained to you using the models in those uh, fantastic artistic pictures in the bottom. Right? Yes? Here's the thing. It does not have to be the same. So this DNA can come from, say, Klebsiella, and this cell can be, for instance, Shigella. Does that make sense? So it allows, it carries bacterial DNA inside the species, between the species, and that extra fragment, it, it may not do anything, or it may get incorporated in the bacterial chromosome and completely change the gene expression. It may bring in an antibiotic resistance trait. Does that make sense? Does it? Okay. So it's like, you know, like you pick the wrong, like in those movies sometimes, uh, in, in a comedy, when people pick the wrong suitcase that doesn't have the I don't know, the work papers, but has the nuclear bomb inside and bring it into the office and then the entire office goes boom. So that's, that's pretty much the idea. Or, you know, they pick up the wrong suitcase and, I don't know, there's some papers that they're not supposed to see. So that's, that's kind of that idea. Phage accidentally picks up the wrong DNA, not its own, but bacterial, and transfers it to another, um, another microbe. That is generalized transduction. So for generalized transduction, lysis of the donor cell must happen. Generalized transduction lysis of the donor. Okay, got it? 
Let me know if you need to pause if you want me to explain something again. Okay, lysis, the donor. Yes. Uh, great question. Uh, first of all, human. these guys cannot infect human cells. These guys can. But human viruses, I'm trying to think if we don't have the direct evidence that this can happen. But we do have evidence that there is horizontal gene transfer between eukaryotes and prokaryotes and that virus genomes can get incorporated into the human, human genome. Whether they're going to carry the genes between humans, we are not sure. Now, my argument against it evolutionary would be this. The transduction in bacteria can happen because the replication rate in bacteria is enormous. And generation time is small, right? So we talk maybe hours between replications, and we talk about billions of cells. So on a statistical scale, transduction can be a beneficial factor, important beneficial factor for humans. <clears throat> uh, in order for something to get incorporated in the genome forever, it cannot just infect somatic cells. It has to infect sex cells. And they are guarded. They are really guarded. So there are events like this, incorporation of the virus genome, but they infrequent. And evolutionary, they, sh they should have probably less importance because we do have sexual reproduction. We do have necessary genetic diversity. Does that make sense? For bacteria, since they don't have real sex, that process pl starts to play an important role. Okay? Now, that was generalized. Another type of transduction is specialized transduction. In this case, phage gets all the way to this point when DNA is inside. But instead of <clears throat> replicating and killing the cell, its DNA gets incorporated into the bacterial one and exists there in the form of prophage. Does that make sense? It essentially becomes something analogous to latency in humans. Late, in humans, latency has slightly different mechanism, but the idea is the same. Phage, instead of killing the cell, inserts its DNA in and waits. Okay? When it waits, such phage is called lysogenic, not lytic, because this whole modal thing was referring to the lytic phage. This is lysogenic phage. Okay, it inserts and waits. Then, various environmental stimuli can tell the prophage to cut itself out. Okay? pretty much being excised from the bacterial chromosome. So far you follow me? Now when prophage gets excised, the excision is not perfect. So when it gets excised, it can also carry with it fragments of bacterial DNA. Does that make sense? Somebody tells you, can you please copy me pages from 50 to 100, Instead, you do 45 to 105, okay? It includes the necessary region, but also some stuff on the sides. Does that make sense? Okay. So what happens next? 
phage particles are being made. You're now familiar with the process. Okay. So phage particles are made. Particles ruin the cell and, you know, they leave it. And when phage, during the next step, next round of infection, inserts its DNA into the new bacterial cell, phage DNA now carries a fragment of an old bacterial one with it. Does it make sense? Okay, like extra luggage. Extra luggage. All right? This is called specialized transduction when it involves incorporation of the phage DNA into the bacterial chromosome and imperfect excision of it and transfer of the fragments of the bacterial chromosome into the new cell. Actually, <clears throat> phages themselves, this stage, represents an important element of genetic diversity in prokaryotes. Because sometimes, insertion of the phage genome brings new traits to the bacteria. Um, I don't... Um, diphtheria. You know diphtheria? The disease? Have you heard? I'm not asking if you had. I hope nobody had. Have you heard? Diphtheria. Huh? Diphtheria. How, how you said? Diphtheria? diphtheria? Maybe. My English is second language, so... Um, anyway, the the one that you get vaccinated against by DTAP vaccine, D stands for Greenibacterium diphtheria, uh, is the causative agent. And it turns out that the toxin that actually contributes to all the symptoms, awful, absolutely awful symptoms of the disease, this toxin is encoded by phage. So it's a it's a it's an old 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 bacteriophage, which genome get got incorporated into the genome of Greenia bacterium, stuck there forever, produced toxin, and it became virulent. The the microbe became pathogenic. You can cut this phage out, and Greenia bacterium still can replicate, but loses all its virulence. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's transduction. Conjugation. I'm you in, in even in the specialized journals, sometimes you can find conjugation or bacterial sex. Because this is true direct exchange of genetic information between two bacterial cells. One cell, which is called donor. F positive donor cell carries so called F plasmid, the fertility plasmid. Due to the properties of the fertility plasmid, it stimulates the formation of pilus between the donor cell and recipient cell. Plasmid gets replicated and he is transferred from the F positive cell to the F negative, the recipient cell, producing two F positive cells. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, this process um, contributes a lot to the antibiotic resistance. Right? Because if you have gene antibiotic resistance gene <clears throat> on this plasmid okay and you have pretty much just one f positive cell in a population pretty soon the entire population is going to become uh, f positive and is going to have the antibiotic resistance gene conjugation sometimes may even happen between species of microbes so not only E. coli to E. coli, but also, say, E. coli to Shigella, Shigella to Klebsiella. So uh, closely related species of microbes can transfer, can conjugate with each other and uh, transfer uh, traits. All right? 
Now next we're gonna yes, we're gonna talk about this and we'll leave uprons and rubus switches for after the break. So HFR cells and uh, F prime plasmids. Now the if plasmid, if F plasmid, the fertility plasmid, integrates into the ribosome, sorry, chromosome, sorry, chromosome, such integration produces the cell that is now called HFR, high frequency recombination. Why we call it this way? Because this chromosome can fold in a certain way, and when it folds, the plasmid gets excised back out of the chromosome. This excision, as usual, is not precise, and often the plasmid and a little fragment of the bacterial DNA get excised together. Does that make sense? No? Sure. So imagine you have a plasmid. Okay? And you incorporate it into the DNA. And then you get it, get it excised. But in addition, in addition to the plasmid sequence, you also cut out a little bit of the chromosomal sequence. And now it's not like this, it's like this. It carries a little bit extra DNA. And that extra DNA comes from the bacterial chromosome of the donor cell. Okay? Now, this plasmid, which is a, a modified, that's why we call it F prime. Okay, that F prime plasmid can then be transferred to a new cell. So that process of incorporating into the chromosome and excision, excision is always imperfect. And that excision provides another means of generating some genetic diversity, of transferring genes between the species. Okay? Actually, um, that high-frequency recombination cells uh, at some point were used to map the bacterial genome. When we say mapping the genome, it means we want to know which genes are located where, okay, in which order they are located in the genome. So what happens is that HFR cells tend to attempt and transfer not just the plasmid, but they attempt to transfer the entire chromosome through the pilus. Now, plasmid is about 10,000 uh, nucleotides long. Chromosome is 5 million. It takes an awful lot of time to transfer a chromosome. Does that make sense? Just a long time. So when chromosome is transferred, depending on how long this pilus stays, how long the conjugation happens, shorter or longer fragments of the chromosome are going to end up in the recipient cell. Does that make sense? You run it for five minutes, you're going to transfer, I don't know, 10,000 nucleotides. You run it for 50 minutes, you're going to transfer 50,000 nucleotides. Does that make sense? Now, then you can analyze the fragment that has been transferred into the recipient cell, okay, and you can figure out which genes have been transferred. And you can say, bless you, this gene is transferred after 10 minutes. This gene is transferred after 15 minutes. This gene is transferred after 55 minutes. And you can assign those minutes to the genes. Okay? And that that is called the time map. Okay? Of the genome. You can see, like, gene pro AB is located at 6 minutes time. Okay? Gene, I don't know, this one is 62 minutes time means that it is transferred during conjugation in 62 minutes. 
it's kind of a neat technique which I believe will soon become completely obsolete since we have sequencing which is fairly cheap okay we're gonna take a break we're gonna take a look at the uh, plates we're gonna finish last couple of slides and